tantos desiertos para recalcar que estoy vivo en medio. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at the Mexican Cultural Institute of the Embassy of Mexico in the United States. We're celebrating our 30th anniversary. And um, I have the honor to have right here with me uh, Mago Serrera and Paola Prestini. Mago Serrera is a very accomplished Mexican jazz singer. She's based in New York. She uh, is currently in San Miguel de Allende, as I understand it. And um, she, she's traveled the world with her music and she has gotten practically every award of her category and uh, we're very proud of her as Mexicans and um, we're very uh, humbled to have her with us. And Paola also, Paola is in Arizona, so we have three different time zones working right now. And um, she is a composer and a connector and uh, she is the artistic director and co-founder of National Sawdust. And Paola, I'm afraid I'm not going to do it a lot of justice, so I would ask you to explain to us what National Sawdust is so that people not in Brooklyn uh, can know what it is. Sure. Uh, National Sawdust is a space that I co-founded. Um, we're now in our fifth season. Um, and it is a sonically extraordinary space that joins together music of all styles, creators of sound of all styles, um, with deep mentorship and incredible performing opportunity. Thank you. And uh, well, I just want to thank you again. We're very honored to have you here. And uh, I know that this is difficult to arrange and to get everyone on the same page on three different places, three different cities. And also, it's difficult, not just because of uh, physical distance uh, and all the physical distancing that we're having to do because of the pandemic, but because it's also a time of a lot of pain and a lot of, of rage and uh, of clamors for justice um, in the face of, of really just harrowing racism and inequities. And I think we're going to inevitably have to speak to that because we are uh, talking about the new normal and what that represents for arts and culture. And um, uh, the, the new normal is not still here. This is nothing like normal <laughs> at all. And uh, we know we're gonna have to take certain um, precautions for a little while. We don't know how little actually. But um, I would like to, to just ask uh, Magos, we were supposed to see a video that we're going to show our audience in a, in a little bit uh, that we commissioned for our anniversary. And uh, we talked to you about it. And we wanted to, to create something and to give you the freedom to create something, even in the midst of the complexities of doing it. And I know that you were in San Miguel de Allende and Chano Dominguez was in Barcelona. Could you tell us about that, how that worked? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having us. I'm so happy to be here and with the audience that is, is joining us in our platforms. I'm so happy to share this space with Paola. Um, I have to, to say a little bit more about National Sados as I consider it my artistic home in New York. and. I'm incredibly grateful for Paola to making me part of that because it gave me a sense of belonging in such uh, an intense and vast scene, uh, artistic scene, which is New York. Um, and I'm so happy to share this conversation with her and with you um, because National Southers not only represent a space, but also, uh, also a social, an incredibly deep social awareness platform through arts. So I think um, this is going to be great. 
And um, now talking about this video that hopefully we're going to get to see uh, later. Um, I think this is a, a beautiful example of, of what we're uh, facing right now. You know, like the, the impulse of artists is to, to create. Um, it doesn't matter what it's happening, uh, but we, we want to create. And I want to, I want to quote something that I read uh, on an interview of director uh, Peter Sellers. Um, and it says, uh, whatever is at hand might serve to make ourselves more alive. Uh, tragedy serves, history serves, spirituality serves, human relationship serves. And now, if we can figure out what we need and what we don't need, maybe we will emerge differently. And this exercise of doing this video commission by you guys to celebrate your anniversary. Thank you. Felicidades. <laughs> Felicidades. <laughs> um, it was a challenge because uh, Chano, uh, which is one of the greatest you know, pianists of our times, and he was a, a visionary that put together flamenco with jazz uh, back in the days. And um, I grew up listening to his music, and he was in isolation in Barcelona. We all know that Spain was one of the more, more affected um, places in the world by COVID. And so we had to wait a little till, till they were able to go out for two hours, you know, like for shopping or whatever. And Chano took the risk to go out. They lent him this space, this uh, venue, uh, because we wanted to do beautiful, you know, with the black background, like to give something different of what we have seen for the last three months on platforms, you know, with this um, uh, apps that we've seen, we wanted to offer something different as an exercise. And I was able to, they lent me here in San Miguel in Mexico, um, a theater, a beautiful, beautiful venue, a theater that it's amazing. And I went there myself, someone opened the, for me. And it was a very strange experience, you know, to be alone on stage uh, recording over Chano's um, muse is playing, trying to make it alive and to make it interactive as the nature of jazz is, you know, to play in the moment and to really make, you know, bring it into under my skin and really make it alive and, and me and really mean the, 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 the lyrics of this incredible song. Um, but also the experience, it's when I actually understood the power of what is happening. I was alone in this venue where I have performed so many times, a beautiful theater, empty theater, uh, alone singing. <laughs> and I really felt the lack of humanity. And um, so it was a beautiful exercise. And I think that the, the, the final material was a beautiful uh, video with a really powerful, timely song by Victor Heredia, uh, which we all know by Mercedes Sosa singing. And, um, and it was just a generous uh, effort by Chano, which I'm incredibly grateful, and, and Jose, uh, the cajon player. And also the guys, which is also something that we're going to talk about today, you know, like uh, Alex Wenger and, and Oscar Sembrano, the out, my audio people, which make a beautiful work because we recorded in a, you know, through our iPhones and, you know, the resources were so limited. And the sound is amazing. They did amazing. an incredible job and also Adrian Tillman, who, who did the editing of the video. And uh, Magos, did you, did you get a chance to listen to Chano's uh, arrangement of the song beforehand? Did you know what he was going to play? Did he know what you were going to sing? Um, I mean, I know the song, you, you, you had a, uh, talked about the song, but this is not uh, Mercedes Sosa's Razón de Vivir. It's, it sounds so different. It's, it just has your imprint. And um, I was wondering when I saw the video, how did that work though? I mean, did you talk about this before? Well, I, th I think that's the beauty of music, you know, that, and the beauty of, of particularly of, of jazz, you know, that um, you, you make music, it doesn't matter where it comes from or, and how it gets to you, you just make it yours. And uh, we talked about the form, what we wanted to, to, to do as a form, the key, of course, mm -hmm. but I didn't have any control on how, on how he was going to perform it. it. Mm -hmm. I just, I just want, I really wanted to have a, um, but there is this element that happens when you play live that it's, it's, it's life, you know, that it, it has, it's, it's nuances of live performance, which actually is reflected in the, in the, in the, in the video. And um, when I got Chano's part, I just um, navigate into it 
as many times as possible to really understand you know, to really feel that I was with him right. in the room and just transform it into my own thing. Well, we're very grateful that you, that you took the, the time and the interest to do that. And Paola, this actually brings me to what I wanted to talk about, uh, this, this experience with Magos. The, one of the first things we saw after we had to uh, isolate in our houses was um, artists sharing their art for free uh, from their living room homes uh, on sweatpants, just singing, playing the piano. Uh, I saw plays taking place literally in, in living rooms, uh, people reading their stuff, lending it for downloading uh, free of charge. And that, I mean, that was, um, that gave us hope. It helped us pass the, the time uh, thinking about something other than the tragedy that was going on around us, but it's unsustainable because this is how most of these artists make their living. This is how they actually get paid. And um, I, I feel like very quickly it became something that we expected they did. Like, lend me your content, like sing for me. I'm going to do a live show on my YouTube channel, and I would like you to sing. Um, and I don't think everyone was prepared to offer fair retribution. And mm -hmm. I think also this is especially hard in the case of artists and uh, 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 of color, I think, just because uh, as, a, as a rule, they're freelancers, uh, all artists are, and they, they're not under contract most of the time, or just not the most famous ones at least. And uh, what do you think should happen now? Because it's been three months. Uh, we, we cannot keep this going for, for a lot uh, longer. And uh, how would you, after the emergency, uh, now it's the pre-normality, I would call it, before we start going out, but not being able to go to venues and to Mm. sit close to other yeah, people? So How would you manage it I, from I mean, National Sawdust? Well, I, I'm going to speak to it as both um, someone who, you know, writes music and someone who founded a space. Um, I would say that the first instinct um, for all of us, uh, you know, because we connect through our music, um, is was to express ourselves in moments, um, you know, where we, we don't have connection all of a sudden and where there's so much at stake and where there's so much unknown. And so I think the first impulse to share, um, you know, to share moments together in the ways that everyone knew how was very um, instinctual and very natural. I think uh, pretty quickly after, uh, you know, at National Sawdust, you know, and I can only speak to National Sawdust, um, it was very clear that we would have to pivot very immediately to address the immediate kind of needs of, of artists. And I think that um, we, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job. I think like everybody else, our first instinct as well was to share archives and to put, you know, to put the work that we had been doing for five years out there. But pretty quickly after, we were very fortunate to receive um, a really uh, significant um, anonymous donation that then ended up being a, an incredible incredible foundation uh, called Alpha Dean, um, which supported essentially our transfer to a live stage where we were able to pay over a hundred artists, um, wow. you know, significant funds to be able to perform, but also to transfer the kind of mentorship that we were doing in the venue um, to essentially mentorship in this kind of digital age. So how do you sound, you know, how do you actually work with recording equipment? How do you make sure that you sound good? Um, and so I think that ability to pivot is, is really specifically because one, we are artist led and I'm a practicing artist. And two, uh, you know, we were, we were, we were ready to um, completely reimagine a business model, which is much harder to do when you're a legacy institution and you have so much more at stake. So I felt fortunate that we were able to be responsive, but I also think that, um, you know, we're in a very particular time. A good friend of mine uh, said to me, you know, I'm an evolutionary and you're a revolutionary. And I had never thought of myself <laughs> that way. And what I realized actually is that we need both. We need to absolutely revolt against the things that are so um, wrong in our society. And there's something really uh, significant about the fact that it's all. Mm -hmm. See, Magos, this is the kind of thing 
Oh, there she is. <laughs> there so, she is. You know, the first thing I was just saying is this need to kind of immediately address all these things coming to the surface, um, and then how do we act? So how do we listen and how do we act to address, um, you know, in the ways we can through art, um, these very, very complicated uh, times that we're living in? And uh, I, I want to come back in a little bit to uh, fundraising and crowdfunding, because I think this is something that's been going on uh, during the, the pandemic. But um, I, I want to, before that, I just want to ask you both, how, how do you feel about this? The way I see it, there's um, all the supply chain of, of, of the creative industries has, has to evolve, as you've said and it has to reinvent itself. But I think there's two, um, the two ends of that supply chain is the one, are, are the ones that concern me the most. And that's the actual creator and the audience. Because as the connectors, because I, I, I really just love that you use that word, as connectors, as the managers of venues, there's still something that we can do. Uh, we have to adapt, uh, most certainly. But I think creators and audiences are being, um, we're asking them, we're asking a lot of them. We're asking creators to, to work on very difficult circumstances and we're asking audiences to modif modify what they expect from the experience. And um, how would you think that would work going forward? Not hunker down like we are right now, but not at full capacity uh, like we won't be able to be for a while, at least. Well, I mean, it, I, I think Magos, we can speak about how we're doing it together in terms of the project that we're about to embark on. And I think our artists, look, you know, artists throughout time have always been, you know, extremely resilient, but also have had really, really difficult times creating um, you know, creating in, in challenging circumstances. There's all sorts of gatekeeping. There's the reality of not being able to, um, you know, afford living. There's, if you choose to be a parent, how do you vibe? I mean, you know, economically. So there's, there's all sorts of challenges. And I think, if anything, artists are really equipped um, to kind of pivot and to ask really difficult questions um, and to kind of lead uh, lead with change. So I think in terms of how artists are going to be creating, there's going to be a resiliency, but the truth is the, the kind of larger institutions and, and foundations, which they are doing, are going to have to step up because the system right now um, is, is not going to work financially uh, to, to kind of bridge, if you will, um, to the next phase, which I don't think is going to be a new normal because I think it's going to be very different. Um, and then I think for audiences, I think everybody wants that moment of connection. And so people are more open to absorb content in different ways. Um, and I think that people are working, you know, venues and artists are working to kind of create high caliber content um, and high ca caliber collaborations in really new and exciting ways. You're right. Magos? Right. And, and I think also, um, so let, let's just uh, address something that the music, in, the music industry has been changing like very dramatically way before COVID. Um, and uh, so the way we grew up uh, with the music industry is not existing anymore. Right. Um, so as Paola said, we have been reinventing how we, how we manage our business part as creators. Right. Um, way before COVID. So I think this is just another step to, to, to navigate as creators. And, um, and also just adding to what Paola said, um, and not to be repetitive, I think uh, there is also a point that I want to address, which is also the audiences, you know, because we as artists, uh, we create in the spirit of closing the circle. You need the audience to make sense of what you create. Um, so it's both the responsibility of the artist and the audience to respond. So I think this conversation that we're having and the ones that we're going to have for the next years, uh, the years to come, come I, um, we have to involve also the audiences. You know how we all reimagine how we're going to perceive art, how we're going to consume art how we're gonna uh, reimagine the public space. 
uh, how are we going to participate in inhabiting the ven the cultural venues? Right. Um, so I, I, I think this is a conversation that has to be also open to the audiences, um, as we all benefit from from culture and arts. Um, and obviously, right now there are, uh, and I think we, we talked about this uh, before this talk, uh, Ishnik. There are already many initiatives that are happening for artists to. Um, monetize what they're doing, Patreon, Facebook uh, is creating already a platform that works that way too, um, uh, bands in town. So of course there are many, many initiatives that are going to start uh, helping artists to monetize, uh, selling marriage. Um, but I think really uh, we have to re-educate in how we're going to, as audiences, how we're going to support our artists. Um, not in the spirit of let's support them to, it's like, let's all make this happen and be benefit, you know, and benefit from, from, from what art brings to all of us. Um, and also try to, to replicate the experience, which is never going to be the same, um, mm -hmm. of the live performing experience. Right. And, uh, we're going to have to learn to consume content differently. I mean, at least for, a, for right. a while. And I think that's that's one of the hardest things um, as far as, as art and culture as I see it. And um, uh, n not the least because as we just experienced, we have some difficult uh, technical difficulties that are completely out of our control. And uh, um, we, in, in in the spirit of trying to replicate the experience of having you live and to roll the video before we started uh, our conversation, we planned it out, we rehearsed it. I mean, it's not like we just connected you to Zoom and, and started talking about this. This has taken a lot of time and still there, there's something that happens that is beyond our control. And in this new medium, I think we run the risk of just losing the audience and you know if it stops if if it crashes if we lose paola for a minute then people are just going to move on to the next thing on their feed because there's so much of it right now and um, I, I think we're going to have to to learn to be more precise on what we put out there and what we consume as as audiences and both as creators i would like to talk to you about what we mentioned before about these ways to monetize. Um, uh, I think we lost Paola. She'll come back. <laughs> there she is. And um, like, like, like Patreon, could, could you uh, tell our audience what, what model Patreon is, what kind of work they do, and how it's working for, for performers? Uh, do you want to go ahead, Paola? Whoever. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you do that because I, I actually haven't used Patreon. Okay. Um, so I can speak of it, you know, different kind of fundraising models, but not that one. <laughs> and then we'll go to you, Paola, about with right. different models. Um, well, I, I'm myself, I'm exploring it. <laughs> and the reason, uh, the reason why I haven't, well, first of all, Patreon is like a platform where your super mega hyper fans are going to uh, get to see, you're going to have access to um, materials that other people in the in social media don't yeah. have access to. Okay. Um, and you pay, you know, a membership, a monthly membership to be part of this platform. I think it's great because then you can actually moni uh, monitor who your fans, you know, like super fans are, mm -hmm. uh, and the ones that really want uh, this con uh, content, they're going to go there. Um, so I definitely think it's 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 and it's been being created by a musician, so mm -hmm. so that's a big difference uh, because he understands uh, what what the artists need and what your audience need. Um, but I haven't signed up because I, again I think it's a time to observe as well because mm -hmm. as Paula said, our in, intuition tells us as creators do things, yeah. be there with the community, be you know embrace everyone and be embraced um but i think we, we i mean to me I'm, I'm being very wise and very careful about why what i share and how i share it um and this is something that needs to be said because we've been building our artistic careers in my case for over two decades 
and um, and everything that we share to our audiences is is very carefully produced, um, as it's a reflection of decades of, of hard work, and you want to keep that uh, that level of quality and and artistry and you know so so I think it's it's very important to 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 really level out what you want to share it, how you want to share it, and um, and also to to educate all of us as we go, as we learn this new reality, to really um, produce that, you know, to be, to be very careful about how and, and what we share. Um, I think that's, that's what I, you know, I, but I haven't navigated too deeply. Okay, in, but you're considering part. it. Let's just, let's just yes. tell your super fans that you're considering it. Just that's right. And Paula, what other, model, other models have you seen that might work? Well, I mean, I can, I can only speak to the models, you know, uh, for how I built my career and how um, mm -hmm. I helped build National Sawdust. And, you know, when I was, you know, graduated from Juilliard, I started the first nonprofit that, um, that I co-directed. And for me, it was interesting. I was a, a Paul and Daisy Soros fellow, and I kind of created a family um, of support and of um, like a, a, I guess, yeah, just a very nurturing network of people around me um, that organically grew with me and I grew with them uh, to create a supportive network around the work I was doing. That really came out of necessity of being a woman composer and realizing how many obstacles were out there in terms of the gatekeeping that exists at every level of our industry. And so it became much easier for me and more authentic to who I was as a human being um, to really create a, a network of support and of people who believed in me and who I believed in them. There are challenges, you know, in terms of building a philanthropic um, community, uh, in terms of, you know, educating each other. But, but I think the thing that I've noticed and that I've loved the most about building a network of support um, is that I see these relationships as, as exactly that. They're relationships. I learn from them. They learn from me. We challenge each other. There's um, situations in, in which we grow, in which, you know, we've challenged each other. And I think that is very human um, and is, is, is something that I've always and then look into building National Sawdust, where we, we have a, you know, a, a quite large body of support. And I feel the same way with the foundations with whom I've nurtured um, relationships with, is that we're growing together and there's a kind of philanthropic mission in which we're aligned and we can create change together. So I think, you know, that is kind of how I've adopted my own career in terms of, uh, you know, I, I do commissions, so I'll do operas like people commission, but then I also commission myself. Um, and then build that, you know, body of support around work so that I can express myself and grow in the ways that I want to do. I think going forward, we're going to see um, a lot of foundations committing um, to addressing the issues of gatekeeping that exists at all levels in our industry in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of all the inequities that, um, that we face. And I, I think this is a really good moment. Um, and it is a moment of rebellion and it is a moment of evolution. And so I, like Magos, am um, listening. I've had work canceled for years that I've been developing for five years. So I'm building. And, and when you build, um, the great poet Borges said, you have to build a damn stone. Mm. And so there's a feeling right now that everything is crumbling underneath me, but at the same time that there's a great possibility to rebuild in new ways. And I don't want to miss that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, have, we have a lot of... of very kind messages. They're congratulating you both and they send you love and hugs. And uh, I have a special <laughs> so one nice. from Ambassador uh, Barcena, who's our ambassador here in the United States. And she says, thanks to all who are accompanying us to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Mexican Cultural Institute. To listen to Magos and Paola is very illustrative. As Magos says, it's never going to be the same after the pandemic, but we are learning to do concerts and other artistic activities different. And um, I think we just have to, you know, get with it. We're gonna have to learn to do it differently and to consume it differently and to enjoy it differently for a while in the hopes that we can go back to packed concert halls and movie theaters and and um, I, Yeah, stadiums. but I also think, you know, it is going to be different when we go back. And I think that is a huge opportunity. You know, I think, I think of, um, you know, 
how this kind of era of extreme communication allows us to collaborate internationally in ways that um, that might have been prohibited before because of our own mindsets, or how forever people in disability communities were told that they couldn't work from home, when now companies right. are seeing because it's economically viable that in fact not only can they work from home, which is the right equitable thing to do, but it actually benefits them. So how can we use these moments to actually further change um, and be change agents, which is really the history of being an artist. Right. That was actually my next um, uh, topic that I wanted to to review with you guys. It was. Um, it's been hard uh, on everyone. It's been weird. It's been unexpected. It was unexpected, but something good must uh, have come out of this. Even even now. I mean, I know looking back, we're going to be able to. Uh, remember longingly about the time we got to spend with our children or with our parents or um, the time the free time that we had to create or to just submerge yourself in our projects but right now if you had to say something right now that you that you find that it's not that bad uh, as far as uh, your creative processes go what would you say it is both of you of course um. Well, to me, and, and I, I'm very careful about saying this because I know the experience of isolation, there are many, many different experiences of yeah, isolation. They're yeah. not the so same for anyone, with, right. with, with all due respect of those that, that have having a, a, a non, uh, you know, a, a very, very hard isolation experience, uh, to me personally, after, you know, making the adjustments of survival and traveling and moving around and because I live in New York and so after that part has been solved and you know after all the mm -hmm. overwhelming ideas and everything um, to me I think it gave me the opportunity to stop for a second and um, and I think this is going to lead me to, 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 to something that we want to share together Paula and I um, you know as, as New York based artists you just go and I, mm -hmm. I've been going for, for 15 years. And this means uh, creating, learning, growing, evolving, um, reimagining, making things happen, making the impossible possible. Um, so I've seen National Sadas grow from nothing. Uh, I've seen myself traveling the world and sharing my music, playing with incredible collaborators. Um, and all of a sudden, everything stops. And to me, it has been an experience of, first of all, uh, being incredibly grateful for um, what has been built over the years um, as an artist and as a, and as a person, you know, what New York uh, pushed you to, to be, you know, yeah. to, to find your, your true nature as an artist mm -hmm. and as an individual. Um, so for me, the, it's been a very, a journey of, of gratitude, um, of gratitude of the people that has opened their doors to me and that has believed in me in throughout these years, including, of course, Paola and many, many other uh, friends and supporters throughout these years in New York and around the world, including, of course, the Mexican diplomacy and, and um, my, the cultural uh, house in, in my country um, that has been an incredible support for me to fly and to really, you know, expand my work uh, having this structure. Um, but now, I think, as Paola said, I think it's been revealing a new opportunity to, to do things differently. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Paola and I have had this conversation off the record, you know, being a woman in New York, uh, as an artist, as a producer, as a... You know, it's, it's not easy um, and it creates, you know, very thick skin and, <laughs> and you have to sacrifice a lot. You have to, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy conversation. And to me, I have arrived into a point and this isolation has helped me to realize that, that there are many ways to do things um, that I can, if I had had the energy and the, you know, the aim and the willing to, to create what I have created, I can transform it into an, a more effortless uh, way to do things with more uh, well-being around me um, without hurting myself traveling all over the world and, you know, like really uh, exhausting situations. 
um, but still missing, I miss New York big time. Mm -hmm. I miss, I miss the spirit of, of the New York community and, and uh, the so a stimulating uh, community that, 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 that is. Um, and because of that, it took us like one month since the COVID started that Paola and I were like, what are we going to do now? <laughs> well, let's do something together. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's, it's bringing um, new opportunities, new, new lights to understanding, new, uh, new and refreshed um, ideas of how we do things and what we want to do and what we want to say as well. Paola? Magos, you said that so beautifully. Um, I would just add that I think there's, at least in my life, been very few moments where I didn't know what was going to come next. And I think that kind of, um, you know, repositioning allows me to reset my values and reset my energies um, and my priorities um, in ways that I, I, I do feel very fortunate to be able to do. And so that's kind of where I'm at right now is, you know, I'm, I'm midlife. I've accomplished a lot. Um, but there's a lot that I haven't said, and there's a lot that I haven't done, and there's, you know, things that probably need my energy where I can allocate it better. And so I'm very, um, you know, scared and excited about how to best use my energy going forward so that I hopefully can have a good impact um, and participate in the change um, that I'd like to see. Um, I think on a personal level, it's been incredible to, you know, to be with my son and my family. I sacrificed a lot to build this space when he was little and to be able to be with him every day is something I will just cherish for the rest of my life. Right. Well, we're grateful to, um, first of all, to have you here with us, to know that you're safe, that <laughs> you have a space Thank where you, you can um, keep creating and producing art and making our lives more beautiful with your work and um, uh, please uh, I this is very important for me I really want you to keep us in mind when you think of ways that we can help the communities with which you work in, in you. New York in the United States uh, in Mexico Magos of course uh, just think of us as a partner we would be more than grateful to collaborate with you and more than honored to do it. And I'm sure that our public would be very, very happy to be able to help with these projects too. So if you think you. of uh, ways of funding certain projects, we can put them out there for our audiences to share with their loved ones. And I'm sure we can just keep growing this network that uh, now has made us, made our paths uh, cross Paola, maybe they wouldn't have. And I'm so grateful to be able to, to, you know, to speak with you and to also speak with your community. It means a lot. Yeah, we're very, very happy that you could. And uh, even though this is happening in Brooklyn, in New York, and it wouldn't be my constituents uh, <laughs> like normally, <laughs> I think we can, we can start um, thinking that this new medium uh, must help for that. So keep us... Just keep us in mind. We're your partners. We're more than happy to help you any way we can. And Magos, again, let me thank you for the huge effort you and Chano went through to give us this beautiful video that is going to be part of uh, the memory of the Institute forever. It just uh, uh, we're going to play it. We're going to we're going to play it at the end. So hopefully everyone can see it. It it just it gives me chills just to hear your beautiful voice and, and the way that Chano played it. And uh, like um, the, the last credits of the video say, we dedicate it to everyone that has not been able to have a peaceful uh, and isolation as everyone else. The frontline workers, uh, the delivery people, the drivers of public transport, farmers, uh, people in difficult situations in an environment of violence where they have to isolate where they're with the person they fear the most um, and all the people that have been able to stay home and have stayed home because uh, that's half of the work. 
I want to thank you both again from the bottom of my heart. Um, I feel like I made two new friends this afternoon. I'm very proud to have you here and to know you and to be able to say that you were here. And uh, let's stay in touch. Looking forward yes. to it. Muchas gracias, Ishnik. Sí. Muchas gracias a todos, everyone that made this possible. Stay tuned for, for this isolation. It's going to bring some new music together and some new <laughs> collaborations with Paola and myself. Um, and also, I hope you enjoyed the, the, the video that we had prepared for you. Muchas the video, gracias. just so everyone knows, it's going to be, uh, that video is going to stay in Magos' YouTube channel, so you can see it there. Should anything happen, well, we try to, <laughs> to show it to you. And it's going to be on the Mexican Cultural Institute's uh, YouTube channel as well. So you can always go there and see it. We'll make sure to share it on our social media so you can. Uh, thank you very much for being with us this afternoon and helping us celebrate our 30th anniversary. Thank you to everyone at the Institute for their hard work, to Laudable Productions for their great ideas and very hard work as well and hope to see you very soon. Muchas gracias. Adiós. Gracias a todos. Para decidir si sigo poniendo esta sangre en tierra Este corazón que bate su parche, sol y tiniebla Para continuar caminando al sol por estos desiertos Para recalcar que estoy vivo en medio de tantos muertos Para decidir, para continuar, para recalcar y considerar Solo me hace falta que estés aquí con tus ojos claros ahí Razón de vivir mi vida La soledad que llevamos todos y las pérdidas Para descartar esta sensación de perderlo todo Para analizar por dónde seguir y encontrar el modo Para aligerar, para descartar, para analizar y considerar Solo me hace falta que estés aquí Razón de vivir mi vida Ay, ay, ay Fogata de amor y guía Razón No